嗨，大家好，大家礼拜四晚上好。那我是欧弟，那今天很开心呢，有这个机会可以跟大家这个探念有台湾的社群伙伴再一次在线上聚会。那上一次从上一次聚会到现在又过了三四个月了，那不知道大家疫情期间都还好吗？那这一次呢，我们特别邀请到这个《Tiny Me Cookbook》的作者，就是 John Marco 来这么做一些分享。那在分享之前呢，我想特别感谢这个呃，半半学。那半半学是一个这个线上的一个共学共好的一个团体。那我知道这个这次半半学也有也有很多的这个成员也有参加这个活动。那希望未来呢，持续我们可以更多的这个。伙伴，那也可以透过 Tiny Me， 通过慢慢学去了解更新的一些技术。好，那现在时间差不多了，那我们现在就开始今天的 present。那今天这个讲题呢，是这个刚才提到，就是我们在找这个要特别邀请这个这个 John Marco 来跟我们做一个分享。那他是我们这个。呃 ，on the machine learning group 里面的这个 tech lead， 那负责这个 AI 一些 software 的 framework 的开发。那在开始之前呢，我想先跟大家呃，就是介绍一下我们在 Tiny ML 这个我们的策略的伙伴。那包含了像是 analog device， 刚才是说 n n device， 然后 on deep deep light， 那 edge in plus emo。然后 photo hub， 然后 green wave， green wave， 然后 graphs， 然后 top G， 然后 image image map， 然后呃 IT emails， 然后 keras， 然后 latest AI， notes AI， NSP， pony， 然后是 QNEX， 然后 Qualcomm， reality AI， realty， Renesis。Sap, City Studio, Sensible, Silicon Lab, Sony, SD Micro, String Analysis, Synaptics, Sense Sense， 然后 Synaptic。那这边都是我们在这个 Tiny M 这个 organization 上面，就是我们一些策略的伙伴。那他们都有一些 machine learning 方的一些方案。那透过这个那个 Tiny 的平台，那大家可以去呃更了解更多他们的细节。那另外呢，在 Tiny 的苗，如果大家有关注这个我们的那那的 Newsletter 的话，就知道我们在呃六月十五号会有一个 Tiny 的苗的 Auto M 苗的 Forum， 那这边有这个 QR code， 大家可以上网去登记，然后去注册。那除此之外呢？那我们在下一次会是在别的 region 也有一些 Tiny Me 的 talk， 那他会是也是讲这个跟关于这个 AI 的一些一些 solution， 那欢迎大家也可以注册。那要怎么追踪这个 Tiny Me 呢？其实有两种方法，一个就是透过这个 Meetup， 那在这个 Meetup 这个这个系统上面有一个 Tiny Me， 那 enable 的 ultra low power 的 machine learning at age。那大家可以去用这个 QR code， 然后去注册，然后去加入。那目前来讲呢，这个有大概有九千多万，将近一万个 member， 然后有四十五个 group 分散在三十六个不同的国家。那像台湾，我们也有台北，然后有新竹。那另外呢，你也可以用那个 Facebook， 就是 Tiny M 的 Community 的 Facebook， 你也可以透过这个 Facebook 去了解最新的状态。那我会建议大家可以去用 Meet Up 去。追踪，然后也可以追踪在台湾的社群。那呃 ，Tiny M 有的这个 Foundation 下面，我们所有的影片、所有的这些资讯，都会透过这个这个 Facebook， 然后你可以在 Facebook 上面，你可以去订阅，那是 Tiny M 的 YouTube 的 Channel。那我们会呃在上面会放我们最新影片，然后大家可以订阅、分享，然后开小铃铛。然后目前有有有七千个这个订阅者，然后有四百多个影片，然后有有非常多的 review。好，那接下来呃，接下来我们在那个 Tiny M 有 talk 的话，也会有在别的 region 有些活，有一些这个有一些 present， 那他们会在不同国家去做这个做这个做这个分享，那大家也可以去关注
。那刚才提到了，那其实 j o m a f 我相信在社群大家都已经很熟悉他了。那不管是在 LinkedIn 啊，或者像很多的 d i s c u r s 上面都有一些讨论。那 j o m a f 是我们这个。在 a n 担任这个 software 的 manager， 然后他负责是像 a n compute library 的部分，它是一个 open source 的 framework， 它支援所有 a n 的 CPU、Cortex 的 CPU 跟 c o r t m a l i 的 GPU， 让这个在这项 IP 上面可以去跑各式各样像 convolution 啊，各式各样的这个 machine learning 的 framework。那全家之余呢，他就是对这个各各对这个 machine learning 的这个 embedded vision 都很有兴趣，所以他。就是花了他自己的时间去写了一本这个 t e n i u 的书。那今天我会请大家，请他来跟大家做一些分享。So, so John, so John Marco, so yeah, so it's our precious to to meet with, uh, to have a chance to bring you to meet with the Taiwan community. So, in In the in the very beginning, they were talking about the timing is such an exciting area. We should we should pay attention. Now, you you make a such of a trip and you have a book, so you you teach that every people, no matter is the the college student or is it the elementary school, everyone can have a fun with the timing area. So, uh, personally, I I think that would be very very exciting way. So, that's the reason. So I. I bring a lot of the Taiwan community to to want to learn more from you. So, so yeah, the the, the that's your 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 that 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 would be that would be our honor to have you to give us some of the speech. Yeah. So yeah. 谢谢，呃，奥丁，他们 ，it's definitely a, a super pleasure to be here. And ni hao, unfortunately, I don't I don't know Chinese, but I love to learn it. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to talk about TanyaML, and in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about the the ingredients that make TanyaML so special. And before we start, uh, I believe from what I heard um, previously from Odin,、uh, yes, I'm the author of the TanyaML cookbook. I'm not gonna talk about、uh, I'm not going to talk about the book now. But I'm here also to tell you that we are working to translate the book in Chinese. So we,、um, of course, if you want to be involved or to learn more, of course, don't hesitate to contact me, because definitely uh, is a, an important、uh, milestone、uh, also to have、uh, a Chinese version of Tanema in order to spread the knowledge of Tanema to everyone. So, okay,、uh, this is the agenda more or less. And today、um, I'm gonna talk about the. I'm gonna give an introduction about TinyML, and I'm gonna also give you a, an overview of what the ingredients to build TinyML applications. And let's start from the、uh, TinyML. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> from the TinyML introduction. So <coughs> usually I start talking about what TinyML is. But this time is I want to change slightly the the presentation. I'd like to start actually from why TinyML. So why do we need TinyML? Well, this is、uh, what I think.、Uh, why we bring TinyML or we want to have TinyML. So we want to bring intelligence to the object around us, but with a focus to power consumption, data privacy, and cost. And these is, or、oh, actually, these are the reasons why Tanemal is so special. Nowadays, we talk a lot about sustainability, energy consumption. We talk a lot about data privacy, and also we talk a lot about cost because we want to build something, but at the same time, we don't want to spend a fortune to have something smart. So, Tanemal embraces all of these three. We intend to make. The in artificial intelligence, ubiquitous for good. For good, well, for the Tanyamal Foundation is this: we want to make positive contributions to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And if you are curious about these, you can definitely click on the link here. And the Tanyamal Foundation has a, a dedicated page、uh, to the、uh, Tanyamal for Good. Uh, which is definitely the、uh, reported the seventeen goals that we we like to achieve with Tanya Mal. But 
in practical terms, what is TANML? I can say that uh, TANML is different uh, from uh, what we have, for instance, on a smartphone or desktop. I have been working at town for uh, eight years, uh, working from the server space to microcontrollers. And on microcontrollers is definitely a unique space. But why so unique? Well, in I have been lucky enough to work on performance optimizations from the very beginning. And I can tell you that when we when um, I started with a team working on porting the first convolutional networks on smartphone, for instance, on Android, well, the problem there was just to make the uh, the models fast enough. Well, because actually our smartphones already eight years ago were powerful enough to have to run complex convolutional networks. I remember AlexNet. I remember VGG sixteen. In some cases, also in section B3. The only problem was computational power. But actually, we had enough memory to run this model. Well, with TANML is completely different. Well, what, the, what is the problem? Because the devices we're going to work on are limited from both a computational perspective, but also from a power consumption perspective. Therefore, TANML is the set of technologies of embedded system to enable this kind of smart applications on extremely low power devices. So, and these devices have some limitations because they must be power uh, efficient. So, and these limitations are most of the time from a computational perspective. For example, we may not have a floating point acceleration in some cases, but just integer arithmetic. In other cases, we may have limited memory on board. And there is a reason for that, and I'm going to tell you later why. But although they have this limitation, they have also important capabilities. Because most of the time, these devices are connected to sensors that can sense the environment. And definitely, the sensors can, um, can feed the machine learning model to take the decisions and then make smart um, uh, make, make smart decisions. Have, um, as you can see here, this is the, also the uh, explanation I gave in the book, but I, I wanted to highlight the, in, I, hi, sorry, I highlighted with different colors, different meanings. In orange, I highlighted the ingredients of TANML. Okay, so the ingredients are, well, definitely the embedded system, machine learning, so deep learning in our context and low power device. I also reported the characteristics of these devices because these devices are generally limited in terms of memory and in terms of computational power for the reason already mentioned. I also reported the input for our system. So these devices, the input for, for our device will be our sensors. It could be a camera, it could be a water, uh, um, um, a water sensor, uh, it could be a gas sensor or whatever we want. These will be our inputs for our machine learning models. However, another uh, interesting um, explanation or meaning of TANML, um, I think was given by Alistair. So I had the pleasure to be invited to a panel session with Alessandro from Edge Impulse, uh, Alistair from Raspberry Pi, uh, and Massimo Banzi, who is the CTO of Arduino. And Alistair, well, define TANML in a very simple sentence. In this way, is a level of computing on top of sensors in order to allow smartness in a minimal intrusive way. What does it mean? Well, it means that actually TANML can exist also without internet connection. Well, internet connection is something we can have, but not necessarily something that enables TANML. But there is also something more in this sentence is a lay on top of sensor. So actually is already around us. Um, and uh, these sensors can, the tiny ML can expand the capabilities of these devices. Let me give you an example. If I look at now, uh, I'm pretty sure for instance, you heard about water leak detectors, right? So devices that can detect if there is a water leak. 
what it could be called, what animal could bring that? Well, if it is something above that, what if Tanemel could predict if we're gonna have the wood leak in order to prevent the damage? So that is, something's gonna change. So just to give an example, and what could change also the application that we have already around us and basically improve the smartness. Uh, before I continue, uh, Odin, do you prefer to keep the questions now, or do you prefer to keep it at the end? Because for me, it's not a problem. Odin? Okay, so probably Odin cannot hear me. Okay, so in terms of um, tiny ML applications, okay. Odin, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I was saying, do you prefer to keep the questions now or? No. Uh, no. Okay. You, you can go ahead, yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, in terms of applications, uh, TanyML definitely finds its its home whenever the, the, uh, the, the power from main is uh, impossible or really complex to have. Whatever I would say, it's difficult to have a charger, right? Uh, and if I think about, well, my smartwatch, for instance, well, or the smartphone as well, and the our drones, there are quite a lot of scenarios where we may not have a battery. So this is where these are just a very few examples of where TinyML can live. So definitely, we TinyML wants to bring intelligence on um, these kind of battery powered devices. And what is the goal? Well, the goal is to keep the life of these devices as long as possible because we don't want to drain the battery uh, and recharge that often, right? I mean, this is the, the intent. But here, uh, I mean, I also reported the smartphone and uh, you may wonder, well, the smartphone is a, a, a complex device it means that TanyML can enable all the applications on the smartphone? Well, not really. I would say probably some of the applications that continuously need to run in background. I can give an example. I mean, if I, uh, if I think about the wake up word on our smartphone, like, okay, Google, for example. Well, this is an example of where we have a machine learning algorithm continuously running in background. Well, in order to avoid to drain the battery in a short time, you need to have a very tiny network and running on a low power CPU in order to extend the battery life. Because this is something that needs to run continuously in background and maybe trigger another, another event when the, the keyword, let's say the word has been detected. But battery power solutions, are not just strictly related to consumer electronics, right? Uh, because in the previous slide, I reported um, some application, just to tell you that TinyML is not something that will come. TinyML is already around us and for years, because the first time I heard about TinyML, I also shared in other occasions, was actually a uni, well, more than eight, eight years ago. But TinyML now is more uh, is different from eight years because eight years ago was difficult to train um, a machine learning model, for example. It was you had to be an expert, but also you had to be an expert of uh, embedded system, okay? Because sometimes you had to write assembly code. Now the code that you write most of the time is in C, is portable to other smart uh, to other other devices which is definitely great. So now is definitely in quite a lot of applications. And I would say you don't need to be an expert. Uh, going back to, the, to this slide, there are, I would say, scenarios where uh, TanML can lead, which are not consumer electronics, devices uh, like smartphones. But for instance, you may use a tiny ML or a battery powered device to uh, monitoring a forest, like right? because you want to detect 
a fire in order to prevent the fire to spread over a large area. Well, this is a scenario where you have a battery power device because it's difficult to have the, the, the power from me, but at the same time, you don't want to replace the battery too often because I mean, if you replace the battery too often, sometimes it's truly difficult. Try to imagine a remote region or if you have a thousand of devices on the field. Furthermore, well, when you think about harvest technologies like a solar panel, but these are great, but they add an extra cost on top of our smart solution. Therefore, Tanya must bring something really, really, really efficient from power consumption and can make the difference in this kind of scenario. In one case, it can help to, predict, to, to, to detect the fire and probably prevent the fire to spread over a large area. In other cases, like agriculture, well, Tiny ML can help to exploit the resources more efficiently. For example, we can have a not, um, an automated water um, uh, watering in order to preserve the, the water or irrigate only one part of the field, which probably requires more water than others. Um, still about TANML, I can definitely um, see two, uh, two areas where TANML is applied. In one case, TANML is definitely, um, that does not need to communicate with other devices. I call it centralized TANML applications. These devices are basically run TANML applications, but they don't need to interface or communicate with other devices. They run their own functionality and they return an output. An example, well, handwriter recognition, probably on your smartphone, you have something to recognize your, your characters. The wake up words I mentioned earlier, or the activity recognition. For example, if I'm running, if I'm walking, if I'm cycling, all of these applications do not need to, um, uh, in, I mean, to get data from other devices or to communicate with other devices. And I would say that in this kind of scenario, the intent of TinyML is to trigger a more power hungry functionality in the system. For example, the wake up word is kind of an interrupt, an interrupt that can enable, for instance, more power hungry uh, more software models in the system in order to do other things like, for instance, a streaming, a video, or play music. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, there are the distributed uh, TinyML applications. In this scenario, TinyML exists and may need to communicate with our devices. Or I would say not TinyML, but the device may need to communicate with our devices. The name we usually give to this kind of scenario is, or this kind of network, is wireless sensor network. Because as we know, these kind of um, devices are actually devices with sensors. So definitely this is a network of sensors at the same time. And, but why they need to communicate with other devices? Well, try to imagine um, a scenario where you have a host, which is far away, and you have thousands of uh, let's say uh, devices, small devices spread ov over a large area. But these devices need to propagate the information to the host. But sometimes they don't have a direct link to the host. So they need to communicate this information to the nearby device and propagate step by step this information to the host. And therefore, TinyML can play a role, for instance, to improve the communication efficiency, aggregate the result. Uh, and there are other, 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 other scopes for that. For agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, well, it can definitely improve the uh, irrigation of the system. So these are the two uh, big, uh, big, uh, big animal applications that we have right now. Let's talk about the tiny ML ingredients. So that was uh, an overview of, of tiny ML. But what are these ingredients? So the ingredients uh, are reported in this slide, well, just three. Um, and our machine learning, as I mentioned, a better system and 
um, low power device. So in the book, in the Tanya Mal cookbook, um, I, um, when I talk about machine learning, I implicitly refer to deep learning. So a, speci a specific uh, set of uh, machine learning algorithms like convolutional networks, for example. When I talk about embedded system, uh, in the book, for instance, I refer to microcontrollers. Well, microcontrollers are by nature low power. And since we're using microcontroller, the range we're talking about is in terms of millivolt, or sometimes also below. For example, if we have a microcontroller in a low power mode. Well, these are the, the three big uh, ingredients. And uh, in, this, uh, in this part, I'm gonna talk about microcontrollers and probably, no problem, I'm gonna also talk about the difference between a microcontroller and microprocessor to understand why these devices are suitable for Tanimal. So, um, okay, uh, why uh, ML on microcontrollers? <clears throat> so here I have reported the four reasons why uh, machine learning on microcontrollers. Give me just one second, I take a glass of water. For sure, uh, popularity. So microcontrollers are uh, everywhere. Uh, so are in uh, consumer electronics, kitchen appliances, and healthcare. <clears throat> uh, furthermore, with the IoT, uh, I mean, uh, with the rise of Internet of Things, uh, we have over 20 billion devices just sold in 2018. So there are a lot of devices. Uh, already around us. Odin, may I ask you just one favor? Sure, sure. Uh, could you really, uh, do you still have the um, uh, control of these? No, probably not anymore, right? No, no, I know, I'm not. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So popularity is one of, is, for sure, the, the first reason. So are everywhere used for a lot of things. Um, well, and here there are also some numbers compared to smartphone, for example. The other second important reason is about the cost. They're inexpensive. I mean, if you compare to other, other solutions, well, microcontrollers can vary from a few cents to a few dollars, no more than that. But uh, nowadays, microcontrollers are not just inexpensive and really popular, are really easy to program. So uh, programs that are most of the time written in C, and there are also cases where applications are written in Python nowadays. But, um, and also uh, IDE can be free and web-based. And this is an example, um, where with the Tanimal cookbook, because in the Tanimal cookbook, actually the reader will write the implementations without installing anything most of the time. It will use directly the software, which is cloud-based and is powerful enough to run machine learning workloads. These tiny devices are tiny, but for most of the time will be capable to run um, sophisticated machine learning models. So the other question I'd like to, uh, to answer is why running machine learning on microcontrollers? For example, so why do we need to run <clears throat> uh, machine learning on these devices? Can we run on the cloud, for example? And the reasons are mainly three. The first is about latency. So sending data back and forth from the cloud is not instant. So that is one of the big reasons. So the applications where latency is important, if we consider real time <clears throat> applications, for example. The second thing is linked to power consumption. Because even if you have 
a very low power communication protocol like Bluetooth. This is not efficient. I mean, you, it's pref um, we prefer to compute more and send less in order to be more power efficient in our application. And this is demonstrated also by the, <clears throat> by the chart below where I reported the time spent, the power consumption for the CPU, the radio, and the sensors. The third reason is about privacy. So, well, by nature, well, if we if we run the machine learning on the device, well, we avoid sharing data, right? Because the data will be local and will not be shared with anyone else. However, when I say this, doesn't mean that the application is secure without the internet connection. Think about it, because the answer is in the next slide. I give you just, let's say, 10 seconds to think about this. Okay, let's discover what is the answer. I would say, well, not necessarily, because if we have a microcontroller with a display, that continuously shows sensitive information, do you define this a secure application? Not at all. So this just to give an example that when we say we don't use internet, doesn't necessarily mean that the application is secure because the information can be captured anyway in other form. So let's talk about machine learning because I talk about microcontrollers, uh, but let's say uh, what um, machine learning is, but in a very, very uh, simple terms. So machine learning is the study of algorithms which are capable to, uh, to learn, um, let's say, patterns from uh, the data. I would say machine learning is actually a data problem. If you have the data and the data is right for your problem, well, you will have you'll be able probably to solve also complex problem, but you need the data because without this, you can, you don't, you basically don't have the possibility to train any machine learning model. In other words, the machine learning takes some data with, uh, for example, pre-assigned label, for example, uh, yes, it snows or no, it doesn't if you want to predict the snow. And after the a training process, you will update some weights. These weights, most of the time, will be constant. And keep in mind this, because in the context of microcontrollers, having something constant is actually definitely efficient and can play a different when we deploy a machine learning applications on microcontrollers. Uh, well, the model, this is uh, basically the explanation of what I just said. So the model is only as good as the data used for training. And this is just a repetition of what I just said. So if you want a machine learning model to run, well, you need data. And trust me, the, at the moment, most difficult part is not design a machine learning model, but probably you can reuse already some uh, models but the data acquisition sometimes is the most difficult part. In particular, web brace you handle with sensors which are not that common, and you need to or you work with uh, events which are <clears throat> which are not that frequent. But this slide also summarizes what is the difference between a training phase and a deployment phase. During the training phase, you have this algorithm, which is based on the weights. The weights are changed during the training in order to find the correct output, but the most suitable output. <clears throat> Once the training is finished, the weights are usually frozen and you can deploy this model on the device. So, however, uh, well, when we talk about machine learning, uh, well, nowadays is slightly different, but well, machine learning has a component which is, oh, which was extremely important a few years back. I'm saying it was, but actually it's still important in some cases. 
But let me explain what I mean here. Machine learning relies on data. But in the past, uh, in order to help train the model, usually uh, machine learning engineers use a technique called feature instruction to help the machine learning finding this correct solution. For example, the feature instruction could be uh, colors. So something to extract from an image, um, for instance, colors, shapes, uh, edges. Given this information, well, actually we have the raw data, uh, a different presentation of this data, the network will, will be trained on this and will detect <clears throat> the class. Nowadays with deep learning is definitely different because the feature instruction is inside the training process. So actually the training phase is capable to learn a feature, or the, the suitable features for our problem. And if in the past we could just, let's say, detect or recognize a dog, nowadays we can definitely recognize also the breed. So we can say the dog, but also we probably can, can probably say that it's a sample bird. However, I want to pay attention on this slide because, well, if we think about nowadays, well, I would say most of the people will use deep learning straight away. But there are some cases where, in particular, microcontrollers, feature extraction is still um, a suitable approach. Uh, for example, in audio speech recognition or sound recognition, well, feature extraction is still used for different reasons. One, because they work. Uh, and second, because are also computationally efficient in some cases, because their routines highly optimized for microcontrollers, for instance, exploiting some of the DSP uh, extensions that we may have, uh, for instance, on a CPU or microcontroller. So this, this just to tell you that actually don't discard solution that may already work because deep learning is fantastic, but for microcontroller, we need to deploy something which is efficient. And if it works and is efficient, go ahead and use it. But let's uh, navigate in the microcontroller world. So what is a microcontroller? What are the aspects that make this device power efficient? A microcontroller is, in all intents, is a fully fledged computer. So it's a computer, which means it has a processor, so it has a CPU. It has a memory. And, and all which can be, um, which the memory is usually split into a ROM and ROM. So one which is read only, where you put instance, constant data uh, and the program, and the other one in which is uh, volatile for instance, the ROM. So something that where the content can, uh, disappears when you turn off the device. However, microcontrollers also have peripherals. So peripherals are what, are used, are used by the microcontroller to interface with the external world. <clears throat> For example, the peripherals can be used to connect the, uh, the sensors to get the data from the sensor in order to use the CPU to manip manipulate this data. However, I just talked about microcontroller. Can someone tell me the difference between a microcontroller and microprocessor? Five seconds, and I'm gonna show the slide in a bit. Yeah, you mean the difference between the microcontroller and the microprocessor? Correct. Okay. So and let's ex. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Go, go ahead. So, yeah. Okay. So let's explore the difference. Well, this is a single image which basically reports the big difference. Well, the microcontroller is a computer in all intents. So it has everything. It's tiny, it's on a single chip. On a single chip, you have a very big computer. Uh, well, the microprocessor, I would say, is a component of a computer. So which means you have a microprocessor, which generally is just a CPU, but for building a computer, you need to attach also the memory and other things. So this is the big difference. But if you wonder why we design microcontroller in this way, I can tell you that the use cases are what um, what influences uh, what influence actually the uh, the microcontroller design. So and the reason why we have microcontrollers. 
because this is actually true for every every uh, hardware solutions, right? Because the use case is actually what drive, which actually drives the architectural design choices. Microprocessor, we usually have applications which are dynamic, which means they can change over time. And most of the time also with interaction with the user. With the user. For example, uh, playing some music, playing videos, uh, are general purpose by nature. So they need to run uh, something uh, generic. So we don't know in advance what it can be. So we need a bit of programmability here. And can be computer intensive. Uh, let's, as, uh, let's assume, for instance, we have to train a model uh, with floating point 64. So they are, the CPU may have floating point acceleration, uh, double precision, uh, could have also uh, vector engines or, or other interesting uh, hardware capabilities. Well, microcontrollers have, are used actually, not used, are designed keeping in mind different applications. Applications where are generally um, single purpose and non repetitive. So the device, this means, well, I can program once and I don't need to update too often the application on the microcontroller. The task may also have real time constraints. What does it mean? Well, it means that there are scenarios where you need to take um, in consideration that the, the, the application must respond in a specific time frame. Therefore, these microcontrollers or the CPU microcontrollers are usually designed keeping in mind the latency and the number of clocks they need to respond. This will help, for instance, developers to uh, design with high confidence, I would say, real-time applications because they know the worst and best case when the, then they develop an application. Um, these also influence actually some of the architecture design choices like the cache, for, instance, for example, or microcontrollers, for example. Most of the time you don't have the cache. Why don't have the cache? Well, because you have, first of all, the memory on board, but you want to have control of the, uh, how it's called, the, the latency. You want to have, predict, want to be predictable. There are also powerful microcontrollers with cache, but in a very, let's say, low-end microcontroller, you don't have the cache because you don't, you won't exactly know how many cycles you're gonna fetch the data from memory. There are also, <clears throat> um, uh, another another reason, or actually the, uh, the applications are most of the time battery powered when we talk about microcontrollers. And well, if you have a battery power um, um, application, well, the memory must be on cheap. Even if you don't, you are not a hardware engineer, but I can tell you that <clears throat> every time you put something outside the chip, it will cost you power every time. So that is the reason memory is on board because at least we can save power. We have a low clock frequency, but at the same time, we have <clears throat> reduced computational capabilities. For example, we will probably find just integer arithmetic. So this is the uh, a table summarizing the difference between a microprocessor and a microcontroller. More or less, I already explained. So uh, the difference is, so you can take this for, uh, just for a reference. Um, so in the microcontroller uh, context, um, we physically dedicate uh, two separate memories uh, for instruction and data. As I said, microcontroller don't have a, a strict reprogrammability, right? You program once, you deploy it. The program will live in the program memory, a separate memory. The data, which are the, the variable, the temporary variable you allocate during the program execution, will live in the RAM, for example. And this slide basically explains the difference. But regarding the program memory, there is another thing because the program memory is on in the read-only, is a read-only memory. It can also store constant data. So what does it mean? It means that um, the, if you have a constant data, you can save uh, memory by simply uh, putting the data in the, in a program. 
in other in other words, since you have different memories, uh, most of the time these memories are designed with different technologies, like a flash, for instance, for the program memory and the uh, and RAM or the SRAM for the for the data memory. If you want to keep low the memory pressure on this RAM, which is just definitely uh, most of the time is smaller than a program memory you can put the weights of your machine learning model directly in the program memory. And that is the way we do. So when you have your machine learning models, <clears throat> this, this machine learning model is actually stored in program memory to save uh, and keep low the, uh, the memory pressure. And that is actually the, the other question. So where can we store the weights of our model? So. I already mentioned this. So since the weights are most of the time constant, so we and the program memory has more capacity than the SRAM, it is, <clears throat> let's say, preferable to have the weights in program memory <clears throat> in order to keep a minimum the memory pressure on the SRAM. I have another question for you. So, and I like to give you, let's say, 10 seconds to think about it. So suppose you have a processing task and you have the option to execute it on two different processors, okay? So you have, uh, for instance, uh, processor one, uh, which, is, uh, which, has, um, which consumes 12, let's say millivolt. I forgot to report the unit, but let's assume it's 12 millivolt. And a processor two, which has a power consumption equal to three millivolt. And you have this workload and you have to decide where should I run this workload? Where should I execute this workload? Have 10 seconds of think and think about it, about this question. So what processor would you use for your problem? Uh, I chose the second one, PU2. Let's go. And well, Odin is right, but Odin is right. No. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not, not at all. I'm kidding. I not is not or is not right. Odin. So although you have a better power consumption, this doesn't mean that it is energy efficient. This slide is just to summarize that well, the power consumption alone does not tell you the truth about two processors because one processor can be more computational uh, efficient. For example, um, in the case where we have processing one, which is uh, 12 um, uh, millivolt, okay? But well, actually uh, the, um, the processor one ha could have higher um, uh, computational power, for instance, could be more computational performant, for example, eight times, and it could become your best choice from an energy perspective. And this is actually demonstrated by the formula reported here, uh, where actually what you should keep in mind is not just the power, but also the energy. So how long, because actually the power tells you how fast you drain the battery, but the energy will tell you how much energy you drain from the battery. And to uh, answer this question, you need to know how fast is actually that, uh, that processor. And this is, uh, well, the end of this uh, section, which is about a pseudo code, uh, what, because I talk in generic terms about TANML, but how the TANML application looks like and I can tell you, well, at the moment, most of the time we use TensorFlow Lite and the structure of the problem is like this. Very, very simple. You have um, a function to load the model. The model, as we have learned, is stored in the program memory. So you take the model and you, you know what operators you need for executing your model. After that, you need to allocate the memory because well, you will need extra memory, right? You need to allocate, for instance, the memory for the tensors, temporary variables, and so on. So you need an extra step to allocate the memory, probably in the heap. Once you have finished this step, it's time to acquire the data from the sensor. So you have your sensor, you decide what sensor I need. For example, let's use a temperature and humidity. 
Let's acquire the data and let's put it in, in, in some variables. But this data most of the time are not ready yet for our machine learning um, problem. Mm. And they need to be prepared because they may need a normalization. For example, if you apply temperature and humidity, raw data, well, you can also see that temperature humidity have different numerical range, right? But for having efficient trading, uh, for training efficiently the machine learning model, yeah, this data must be in a similar range in order to converge faster to the solution and converge at the same time to the solution. So preparation of the data means probably normalization, scaling the speech, and may probably removing the noise from the data and so on. Once you have prepared the data, that's it. You just need to run um, a function to, that takes the input and it turns the output. What is the output? The output is what you decide. It could be the label, if for example, it could be, uh, for instance, a value that tells you if it's gonna rain in a few hours, for example, and so on. But these are the five steps that are usually needed when writing a TANML application. So the, that's it for the introductory, for the, let's say the, <clears throat> for the presentation. I have a very simple application that I can show. I don't know if Odin want to take some questions now, or do you want me to go uh, to the uh, next session? Yeah, so, so Jomoko, thanks. So, so I, I think we can, we, we can start talking about, uh, talking about the question first, then we can then move on to the next one. So, yeah. okay, first thing is uh, uh, you mentioned about the uh, actually, I, I like you. I, I think you mentioned about the machine learning is a data problem. That is a, that's a very good thing. So, and uh, I, I totally agree, agree with that. So, and uh, one question. So, uh, the Steven, is, he's a, a asking about, so you, you're talking about the TensorFlow life, right? So how do you, uh, for those kind of uh, platform like Agent Plus, the AITS, Google TensorFlow, like the which one you prefer for the developer or for the community to use for the tiny app? Okay, that's a very very interesting question. So I can tell you that in Tiny Apple Cookbook, I use both. I oh, can okay. use um, so both Agent Plus and I also TensorFlow. Like I can also tell you that. Actually, mm -hmm. Edge Impulse uses TensorFlow Lite. Okay. So I would say, well, uh, TensorFlow Lite gives you uh, control on everything. Um, in particular, I mean, if you want, to, if, you, if you start from TensorFlow, you want, <clears throat> uh, let's say you want to have the model, you want to tweak, tweak it, and you have the experience, you have an ex you are an expert, Mm -hmm. uh, probably TFLI could be a good option. However, if you're not an expert, uh, you start exploring the tiny ML world, well, Edge Impulse is definitely uh, much mm -hmm. better because it tells you what models you should use. Uh, it visualizes the features. Well, that is the cool feature. The mm -hmm. other aspect is what I like of Edge Impulse is the data acquisition. Data agent pulse also has a data acquisition inside the tool, which makes actually a good choice for this reason. Okay, okay, got it. So I th I think you meant you you talking of, you you are you are, you are trying to say that even the, we are we are use the web based the agent plus, but the in behind that's still use the TensorFlow like as a as a as a training kernel. Is that right? That that's correct. That's correct. Okay, cool. So it's used uh, TensorFlow Lite, and in the case of Fraser when running on R, it uses CMC Synan to accelerate most of the machine learning routines. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, let me try to uh, use Mandarin to translate to, to, to make uh, the committee more understand. So, uh, 基本上他在書中他大概是用 TensorFlow Lite跟這個 Agent Plus。那 Agent Plus 
，其实它的核心也是用 TensorFlow Light。那差别是说 a g i n g p a r t 它有做一些这个 data acquisition， 就是一些 data 收集的工作，然后它会有点像是一个呃，不需要做一个额外的 coding， 就是做这个 web web 的 web 的的操作去去使用它。但是我想，呃呃。我认为就是看你看这个，就是我我们呃，就这样的意思，就是看你的这个你的这个 background knowledge。那如果说你其实对这个东西都很熟悉的话，其实你可以直接 from scratch 去做 test testable 来去使用的。So so second one is the uh the, the also Stephen he asking about that. So how how to make the training more efficiency, especially for the resource. Constraint device like the microcontroller or the microprocessor. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I like this question. So please mm. tell the yeah. this person that I really like this question because for Tiny ML, this is the right question we should ask ourselves: how mm. we can make that machine learning model efficient. So um, there are some tricks, and one chapter of the book is about some. Tips to make the machine learning model efficient from a memory perspective. Definitely, you should consider the the fact that the memory the memory is a big problem here. And most of the time, when you use, for instance,、um, when you de design a machine learning model, we should base probably our design choices to what are already there. I give an example:、mm -hmm. mobile net. MobileNet has been designed for smartphones.、Mm -hmm. However, some design choices are applicable also on microcontrollers. For example, not using convolutional networks.、Um, sorry,、uh, yeah, not not using convolutional layers, but using depth-wise convolutional layers instead.、Mm -hmm. They bring memory a memory more a more memory efficient solution. Other tips could be try to avoid pooling layers. Uh, and trying to use the stride in convolution、uh, in convolution layers instead, so there are different techniques. So, but I can、um, I can tell you that one chapter of the book is actually dedicated to this, and the model is actually an image classification in just sixty four kilobytes of RAM. Wow. Okay. That, that's impressive. Okay. Uh. So. Uh. So yeah, so 那个 John John Michael 的的回答是说，他其实在书中有特别一个章节是说明怎么去把这个 model 做有效的圈领在这个 device 上面。那就算是 mobile net， 虽然你在手机上面跟在不同的装置上面，他他在都是做 in image 的这个 classification， 但是的的 recognition 啊，但是 depends 上不同的装中文装置其实都有一些呃 training， 让它变更优化的一些方法。那呃，我想，我想这个这个其实也是这个呃这本书为什么这么受欢迎的原因啊，就是在不同的装置上面，你怎么去有更有效率的部署。So so John, so John Marco, so another question from the Alexandra. So, uh, he's asking about the is there any is is there the possibility to uh utilize utilize the memory, which can reduce the the external external chip like SPI or the or the SRAM. The the off-chip extract. So the question is,、uh, can, is the memory on board enough? Or yeah, I think he question is the how to the more utilize the memory. You you talking about this data memory as a proper memory,、yeah. right? So somehow the model size is too big. So from your 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 experience, how how can we do that? So beside beside the model optimization, what else we can do? Okay. Apart from the model, okay, definitely working on the design, the model is an important step, and that should be considered always. There are other techniques.、Uh, for instance, quantization is a an a, a step, a must. I would say quantization is always required because it reduces by four times the model size、mm -hmm. because we use intake, but also we improve the performance because microcontrollers do, do not have hardware acceleration、mm -hmm. for floating point. The other thing is there are techniques of pruning、uh, and other fancy techniques, but I would say, well, quantization is definitely the the, the technique which is required right now. Okay, so so uh, 
我想基本上来讲，就是 quantization 量化就是一个很好的手段。原本你的 model 如果是三十二 B 的 F B 三十二，它透过 quantization 就可以变成 I N T 八，那就可以省在在这个 data model size 上面就可以减小四倍。那我想说，其实还有很多不同的不同的 h a r d w a r architecture 上面都有一些这个 memory optimization 的方式啊，像是那呃未来我想在 Tiny Mill 的这个的 community time 我们也可以跟大家分享更多。Yeah. So, so John, John Marco, so thanks for your end, the question. So, so actually, I have a, the the one question from my personal. So, so uh, you're talking about the easy to program. That is very important for the time the end. So you mentioned about the IDE should be free or web based. So, why you think that would be so important? Okay. So well. Definitely, if I'm a developer, I like to have all free. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> but definitely, yeah, yeah. it's not possible, right? Definitely, it's not possible. Well, what I was saying is, uh, this is um, if you are, let's say, an entry level developer, you never used microcontrollers. There are free uh, solutions that make your life easier uh, because these free solutions. This means you need to install anything. I can give an example. I think it's easier mm. with an example. If you start developing with TanyaML, uh, having to, to install all the dependencies to chains could be tricky also to understand. Mm -hmm. Having a free cloud-based solution, it's something beneficial. So it, it reduces the effort for just setting up the, the, the environment. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some limitations. There are also uh, not free solutions that may offer for instance, the possibility to predict the power consumption of an application or to predict the performance of an application. But let's say if you are entering this world, the free version are, let's say, good enough to develop very basic application. Of course, for experts, sometimes the free solutions are not enough uh, and they need to upgrade the version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. 呃，我想就是呃，所谓开发者当然是希望是他的这个开使用的开发工具都是都是 open source， 都是都是非常便宜的，就是他不用额外的成本、啊。那我觉得这个这个是一个有趣。那如果透过 web 的话，其实几乎是你只要有个 browser 就可以做操作。So so John Marco, so I think I I I I I make some mistake from the Alessandro's question. So let let me repeat his question again. So is there a possibility to utilize the memory which can resize on the external chip like SPI or Fresh or the, the QSPI, the, the SRED? So the memory outside chip. So is there any possible way to do that? Well, there is, if there is a way to use it. Mm. Yeah, it, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there is the way to use it. However, if we think, keep in mind the power consumption, that could be a problem because mm. they are, the memory is off cheap. This means you need data transfers. Well, mm. in, in other words, it can work, but this doesn't mean that it's gonna be power efficient. Mm. If you want a power efficient and want any battery power, try to use the on-chip memory, which is uh, definitely more power efficient than the external mm -hmm. ones. Okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, I, I, I think we have a little overrun. So I, let, let me ask you the, uh, the, the, the last one, the question. So yeah. the question is that, uh, uh, what are the machine learning model apart from the, the CN convolution neural network can be used? I think that he's talking about a tiny ML. For example, can do the, the regression model can be used? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you give us some examples? Or, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Regression models can be used, for instance, to report the probability of the, the weather forecast. I mean, mm -hmm. the probability of having the rain, for example, uh, LSTM uh, based networks can be used. Um, it can be used also very simple, fully connected networks. Uh, one of the, the projects in the book actually is using simple, a simple fully connected layers, a fully connected network. 
there are cases where you may use decision tree as well. Uh, so it's not strictly related to convolution and effort. The, let's say more complex uh, solutions uh, may be uh, limited by the um, uh, by the operator supported by mm -hmm. I don't know by the flight, but I would say most of the generic ones are supported. Okay, got it. So yes, thanks, John. So uh, pretty appreciate. So I I like a couple of your your, your slides. So that that would be very that would very uh, interesting. So probably uh, maybe you can write the second book, right? So. <laughs> A lot of stuff we, we can dig out more. Yeah. Absolutely. And thanks a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, please go ahead. I think you heard the, the, the second uh, part. Well, yeah. I'm conscious of the time. So, okay. uh, not sure if you want to talk now or you want to uh, probably have a separate uh, session. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe we can put it separate. So, it, it's, That's it's a that's a that's a, a lot of questions. So I th I think that the, the today's session is very the, the interactive. So that's a good. Okay. Yeah. So let me jump into the uh, the the, the, the no, there was, yeah. So okay. Uh, let me change. Let, let me let me swap to the to mentor. So <laughs> so. So yeah, thank you for joining today's session. Ah, that we in today's session, we saw a lot of things. No matter if it's attending email, or if it's seeing this, in this, uh, hardware on the need, or if it's in memory on the need, and how to do some things on the hardware, how to deploy it to the end user. What kind of solution? 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 What kind of 呃，仰赖非常多的这些这些企业伙伴，他们提供了一些帮助，然后让这个社群更强壮。那就是第一个，就是特别感谢 On 在 On 这个在 AI 的这个方面，他做很多的投资，然后这个 On 的的 Virtual Tech Talk， 然后大家可以去关注。然后就还是刚才提到像 Edge In Plus， 他也是做一个这个 ML 的 Platform。然后在 Qualcomm 的 AI Research， 那他也做很多在在 t e n i u m 上研究，那甚至不一定不只是在 IoT， 在 Automotive， 在 Mobile 上面都有使用。那这个 Sensitive， 那他也是一个做 AI 这个很很，就是现在很很很很，就是很有很多那个很多很多不很好的一些 research 的一个一个公司。那另外就是我们也有一些白金的伙伴，像是 Deep 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 Light， 然后像是 Reality AI， 然后像是 Renesis。那 Renesis 在很多 Micro Control 跟 Micro Processor， 就刚呼应刚才 John Marco 讲的，它都可以导入这个 AI 的 solution。然后这样子 Photo Hub， 然后像是 Mesma Integrator。然后像是 latency AI， 然后 NSP， 然后 the C Studio， 然后 Sensimo， Sensimo， SD Micro， 然后 Sensor Sense， 那另外还有很多这样我们的这个呃 the Silver 的的这个策略伙伴，那。刚才提到，就是我们下一个 session 呢，会是由这个在在 a c e n t r a 会是在另外一个另外的六月二十一号去做做这个有个的 t i n y m l talk， 那欢迎大家去关注。好，那以上呢是今天的这个 session， 那很高兴大家能够参与。那刚才在在那个聊天室上有人在问说这个泰呃这个 Jamaco 的书来，那我想说。呃，各位可以上网去摄取一下，在 Amazon 上面都可以做，这都可以看得到。那一开始 John Marco 是，倒是说他也希望，很欢迎在台湾的社群上面有伙伴愿意来做这个中文化的翻译。那我这边再请 John Marco 再跟大家说明一下。So, hi John Marco, so you mentioned about that you you are looking for some of the 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 volunteer in Taiwan in the in the in here they can help translate the book. 
to help the more of the people they can they can understand the the, the technology. Can you say the more word about that? Okay, so we are definitely at the beginning. Uh, I cannot translate the book because I don't speak Chinese, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think we did uh, probably with the TIDML uh, committee in Taiwan. Uh, we can uh, talk to the publisher. The publisher already expressed uh, an interest in this, so to see what we can do uh, to get that, to translate the book in Chinese as well. Yeah. 就是就是社会社群伙伴，大家不用客气。就是说，如果说你觉得你想要对这本书想要做一些中文化的贡献的话，那那我们可以，呃，我们可以多多呃跟呃 j o h n m a r k o 联络，或者也可以直接跟我联络，然后我们可以帮你去一起去让这个社用社群的力量，让这个技术可以把更多人知道。So thanks everyone to join the 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 session. Sorry about a little bit overrun. Uh, not the, actually it's not a little bit. So we we overrun. There may be the, the two. Uh, 50 minutes but uh it's for me it's very knowledgeable so i i learned a lot of stuff so thanks again to john marco thanks to everyone from the community yeah my, my pleasure my pleasure thanks a lot yeah. for inviting me yeah so thanks thanks okay everyone thanks have a good day thank you